Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I always like talking in front of growers because it just feels a little bit more like home to me. The academy is certainly one place to give talks, but they tend to ask very hard questions that, you know, I don't know the answer to either. So, uh, not that I'm going to know the answers to all your questions, uh, but um, anyway, I'll give it a shot. I, indeed, I have been working with greenhouse production for, for many, many years and have given a substantial number of talks to growers. And one thing that I would characterize about this meeting here is I've been surprised at the level of fear that I see here. Usually when I talk with growers, everybody's kind of set in their ways. And, and so when growers, like when flower growers started going out of business left and right, it's like nobody really noticed. The crowds just kept getting smaller. I, I really applaud you guys for being fearful and for noticing that you got to do something because the next step is you won't be in this meeting anymore. And for and if you go out of business, of course, then you know, you'll be doing something else, which might be good. Maybe that's what the world needs, but I seriously doubt that you would look at it that way, right? So uh, Jim asked me to talk to you about greenhouse management and so this was kind of a this kind of a weird thing. I mean, I know that you you have some structures already that we call protected cultivation, and that a lot of you are now thinking about greenhouses and maybe the next step to a hoop house, maybe the next step to a full blown greenhouse, maybe even to a glass greenhouse. So I think part of what I, my job here is to show you a little bit about all these different areas you could go into and what sort of the pros and cons are and going into all these different areas. And then uh, Jim wanted me to spe specifically talk a little bit about how to manage a greenhouse environment. Because it, it may not be so obvious to you, but once you're in a greenhouse, everything changes. In a greenhouse, everything moves an order of magnitude faster. When you're watering, the flow of water is an order of magnitude faster. If something changes to your disadvantage, it's an order of magnitude faster. But on the other hand, plants can also grow, not an order of magnitude faster, but you can get much better production in a greenhouse if you apply all those tools. And one of the things that you're going to be doing as a next step, even if you build something new, some new technology in this direction, I can guarantee you will then all of a sudden start seeing doors open for doing things that you never thought to do in the field because it was just not feasible. Once you're in a building, an in inside an interior space, suddenly you have a lot more opportunities. So um, I've constructed my presentation here not as a PowerPoint. I know this is a departure from, from the, the past or, or the current in some sense, and I'm going into the future. And I've constructed my presentation as a web page, and I'm going to show you, and you just have to follow how I'm clicking through the web page. So it's, it's a little bit different. Your mind has to be um, maybe focused a little bit differently. So basically what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about various types of protected cultivation. And what I have done here is I've basically adapted the things that I teach in my greenhouse and nursery production class, which, by the way, is 30 hours of instruction. And I'm not going to cover all 30 hours, obviously, here. But certainly the greenhouse management part, which normally takes about five hours, I'm going to be covering here in about 20 minutes. So let me just blaze through some of these things. And the things that are only peripherally interested for you guys, I'm going to move along um, fairly fast. Basically, in terms of greenhouse structures, we have two kinds of covers that are involved. We have glass and we have plastic. Glass, of course, is much more expensive. I'll show you the various properties of the plastics in relation to glass in a minute. Different types of structure. You can have a single span greenhouse. This hardly looks like a greenhouse, but it, it's a greenhouse. And um, so ridge and furrow style houses are the old classic, basically A-frame. Ridge and furrow means you have a whole bunch sitting next to each other, creating one large interior compartment inside there. And I've purposely picked older pictures. A lot of this isn't, isn't necessarily brand new, but the, the houses haven't changed. They're still the same houses. The only thing that you will note is different is that here these panes of glass are relatively small. If you were building one today, the panes of glass would be at least double 
the size of these panes, probably maybe even 10 times bigger because the glass technology has changed over the years. And in fact, I'm going to be touching on, whenever I say this blank technology has changed over the years, this should be a little flag to you, this new stuff around that's come along in the last 10, 15 years. And Quonset style houses that are shaped like this, again, you're creating a large interior space. And here you can already start seeing some of the control issues that we deal with. Um, we generally characterize greenhouses in terms of whether they're high profile or low profile. This is an important thing when you talk to greenhouse manufacturers, particularly if you're talking to manufacturers other than, say, the, the United States manufacturers. In Europe, the tendency is to get tall, seriously tall. And so high profile houses is, is, is sort of what's in right now. And the reason is that growers have found that if you have a very limited headspace, as you would with the old Venlo style houses, which are look like this here. This has a special machine on top of it. This is basically a Venlo style house. And with those houses, it was very confining and the plants didn't really have enough room to breathe. There were a lot of pest management issues. So what growers found was basically make these houses taller. And of course, once you've built a house, you're not going to make it taller. So you have to order it from the beginning at the height that you want it and build the right size. So one of the things I would encourage you to think about is as you're looking at houses is buy tall ones. You ta you're, ta you're growing tall things, okay? Particularly if you're going to have uh, trees and containers. I, I, I understand that usually those are maybe as most as tall, but you need that space up overhead to move air around, which becomes very important. And I'll, I'll get to that when I talk about the control strategies. Some of the newer technologies that have come online in, in recent years is the open roof greenhouse style where basically the entire roof opens up to the sky and retractable greenhouses where basically you're basically pulling a sheet of plastic back and retracting it. And this is used extensively by bedding plant growers who sell product that goes into the landscaping market. And they want product when they sell it in the spring to be hardened a little, to have been exposed to the outside for a little bit, at least as part of their production. And with these kinds of houses, you can do that. Now, obviously, we're talking about something in the complete opposite direction of where you're thinking right now. I know that all of you are thinking about exclusion. And as you can clearly see, well, you can see the sky. There's no exclusion going on here, OK? Could you implement exclusion in these houses? Yeah, you could. But nobody has, and there's probably a reason for that. So when we look at these greenhouses, as you're buying greenhouses, you're going to find that for some greenhouses, you have a lot of support structure. That means dollar signs, OK? And for some, you have less. Plastic houses are going to weigh less. So in terms of holding up a plastic house, it's not going to need the same amount of steel to hold it up. Uh, we used to talk about wood as a product. Of course, nobody is building greenhouses out of wood these days. It's all aluminum and steel. and uh, those kinds of building materials. And the stronger the building materials you have, the further you can sped, place them apart, and the larger your sheet of transparent material can be. And we used to say that basically with, with plastic, you could make huge open areas where you, know, you get light coming in, whereas with glass, you can't do that. But I've seen some pretty amazing sheets of glass in recent years. So I think maybe the, the whole glass business is starting to catch up with what we can do with, with plastics. Now, I have a whole set of information here about the glazing materials themselves, the various properties. I'm not going to cover all of this. I'm, I'm basically going to step over a lot of the information. Uh, the main thing is, uh, prior to the 1950s, everything was done with glass because we didn't have plastics that were adequate for the job. And then as plastics started to come around, we started finding that we could get plastics that let an enormous amount of light through, pretty much just like glass, and you could easily build a greenhouse both ways. However, glass lasts forever, and plastic sitting out in the sun lasts a few years. And so the question is, what, what do I mean by few? Well, if you can put some sort of protection over that uh, plastic so that you have some sort of ultraviolet radiation protection, 
then you can get a sheet of plastic to last maybe 15 years, something like that. Beyond that, nobody will make you any promises. And when I say a sheet of plastic, I'm not really talking about film, because with polyethylene films, we have a much shorter life, because these are much thinner materials. And so as you're building a greenhouse and you're going to be using films, you need to bear in mind that you're going to have a fairly short period of time before which you need to come back in there and do a replacement of the film. So when the vendors talk to you about their film, they will be talking about the polyethylene film in terms of a three-year film, a four-year film, and a five-year film, maybe longer. I wouldn't believe anything over five. That's just stretching the truth. Uh, in fact, even five years, well, just beware, okay, it's not very common. Also, it does, of course, still matter how much light you typically have, so if you're in a very high radiation, high light area, you will have a shorter life period. The other problem, of course, is that this plastic becomes extremely important for production during the winter time, and in the winter time, you don't want to be ripping the sheets of plastic off to put new plastic on. And then, of course, if your mindset is 100% exclusion, the time when you have your film off and you're putting new film on, you can get things coming in. So it's trouble. So anyway, I, I'm giving you data, okay? You're going to have to put all this together to see what's going to work for you. And the my perspective on this, what I'm relating to you, is my experience with the ornamentals industry where, yeah, okay, you pull the film off on a nice day in the spring sometime and then put new film on, and having the film off for three or four days is no big deal. Well, if you can't afford to have even one ACP do something and, you know, fly in, then you might not be able to do that. So... Um, Various other materials, uh, certainly the rigid panel materials that are out there, many times you will see these as double layer, Lexan or materials like that, polycarbonate or acrylic materials. These are in the price range of glass, okay? So it, basically by the time you install it, you have a fairly expensive structure. It will last significantly longer unless you install the panels upside down. I highly recommend that you get a pro to do the installation because you can see the operations where they didn't do that. You can walk in and notice that a few panels are the wrong way around. And what that means is after three or four years when you go in, you'll see that some panels are brown and the other ones are not. And then you also get to learn the efficacy of the material that blocks the UV radiation from deteriorating the plastics. Now, of course, in, uh, we're very much interested in other types of um, production systems, and I've included this here, uh, particularly talking about screen houses. Clearly, this is something that's coming along. Uh, screen houses have been in use for quite some time, and of course, the variation here is in terms of how, how big the holes are, how big the mesh is that allows things to get through, and the things that need to get through, of course, are the wind, but not the insects. Okay? That's generally the principle that we're operating on here. So with the larger mesh, you can keep out some insects, but not the smallest ones, and you allow for more air ventilation. With the smallest screen, like a tight mesh, 50 mesh screen, which is thrips screen, basically it's a very tight space inside. You do still get air movement, you know, and, and certainly if you started heating in that space, you would very quickly, quickly learn that most of your heat is actually leaving the building. So. Uh, but it isn't all that much air movement, and it's not enough air movement to deal with the fact that you're setting an interior space out in the sun and that it's going to get hot underneath that because uh, energy gets trapped in that space. And so there are some problems with this, and, and uh, I remember taking a trip into Israel about uh, 10 years ago and walking through some screen houses there and constantly thinking that it really is weird how plants can tolerate much higher temperatures than I can as a human being. And, and actually, this is one of the points I would make to you as you evaluate systems. You need to be careful, on the one hand, for your employees, what the system inside that space is going to be like. But your plants are able to do much, something much different from what you can do. They can survive climates that you can't survive. 
So, but by the same token, you know, you may have plants, well, you won't, but you may have plants that can have the vice versa. Uh, now, the one other problem that I, that I see with all this is that the idea of heating becomes an interesting perspective once you have an interior space. And I'll talk more about how we can control both cooling and heating in these spaces. So shade houses, of course, are, are something very different. I don't need to, I think all of you probably have shade houses now. And basically the idea is to give shade to the plants so that the plants don't overheat. Basically you have tissue and the tissue tries to cool itself through the transpiration stream in the plant. And with certain plants, citrus being one of those, that if you, know, if you can't keep that transpiration stream working adequately, then the plant will overheat. You will get tissue damage, leaves will be brown, bronzed or brown. And so basically we have shade house systems in place largely to mitigate the temperature of the leaf tissue. And uh, there are of course various sort of mitigating elements to this, like you get reduced water use if you can do this. And, uh, and then of course the, any sort of protection from uh, excess sunlight. Other uh, production systems that are out there are tunnels and cold frames. And it may surprise you that probably on the planet as a whole, tunnels are much more prevalent than greenhouses per se. So if you go into Asia, you will see huge expanses of tunnel production. And we could easily use that here, but we find that by the time we've invested that much in what we're doing, we might as well go the next step up to hoop houses and, and uh, take a little bit more control. So let me talk a little bit about heating and cooling a greenhouse. And uh, this is usually is a two hour talk and I'm sorry I'm gonna blaze through it really fast. But I'm, I'm really just gonna point to a couple of particular things because most of you I think right now are thinking screen houses and you're not really thinking heating and cooling systems, but you will be, okay? I guarantee you the minute you're in an interior space, you have to cool it. Remember that a greenhouse is the same technology that we use in the field to solarize the field, to kill everything, okay? So if you're not gonna be cooling, that's what you're gonna be doing. So you need, to be bear, you need to bear in mind is that cooling is an integral part of greenhouse production. In the winter time, you're gonna be interested in heating, okay? So let's talk about how we would do all this. We have three pretty much important design criteria for a system for controlling the temperature. And so uniformity over time means that we want to be able to sustain sort of a, a level amount of, a level temperature set point without too much bouncing up and down. And uh, in the greenhouse industry, particularly in ornamental production, we need to be very careful with this because we can get plants stretching, we can get plants that end up being too short. And in that industry, the product is sold by size, okay? So if you're selling a 22 inch something, well, it's gonna need to be 22 inches. If you're selling a pot of plant that needs to be, you know, 12 inches tall, it's gonna to have to fill in that box for the 12 inch plant. If yours is 14 inches, well, that's not gonna fit in the box, okay? So you got a whole bunch of plants you can't move because they don't meet spec. So uniformity over time is very important. And certainly this becomes an issue and this tends to be how you scale systems for cooling and heating because you need to be able to deal with the hottest days of the year and you need to be able to deal with the coldest days of the year. So you need to be able to have that. Part of that is capacity, so a system needs to be able to uh, generate what you need. And this capacity is always a matter of applying energy. So for heating here in California, frequently we use natural gas to do the heating. Um, and then we have various different types of heating systems, which I will touch upon just very briefly. And then the most important thing for the industries that I deal with is uniformity. Maybe for you that's not as, as important, but in prior talks I've already heard that if you're gonna do so and so and so and so, like fog or whatever, you gotta do it uniformly. So uniformity is an issue, and in, in some sense it is the most important issue because you need to be able to have your product all come online the same way. Everything needs to be a product that meets a certain specification so that when you sell it, uh, you can move it. 
in order to deal with these gradients that we have in the greenhouse, we use uh, horizontal airflow fans, which are basically these interior fans that are stirring the air. The air is treated like a big pot. It gets stirred around. And so you can have a heating spot in one place where heat is applied, and this then moves it through the greenhouse. Another way that that has been handled in the past has been with convection tubes, which are tubes that are usually hanging overhead. People have tried to put them below where they don't intercept light, but that's usually uh, sort of a, a problem waiting to happen because employees trip over them and it makes all sorts of, causes all sorts of problems. So these are systems to try to gain uniformity within that. We also use thermostats in the greenhouse, and usually we have a day thermostat and a night thermostat. Uh, that would be the old style of doing things. The most primitive style would be basically two thermostats. For most systems that you would buy today, you would do that with a computer, largely because computers, the price of computers has come down to the level where it's almost less expensive to have a computer than to not have a computer. So it, uh, I would recommend that whatever you set up, you go ahead and get computer controls in there and then also have enough sensors online to monitor all your compartments where you have your plants so that you can get a record of what your plants have been seeing, which you can then use in diagnosing problems with pests, problems with plants not growing right, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm going to just blaze through the, the heating systems really quick. Basically, we have hot water systems and steam systems. These look very similar, usually looking for some way to get the water temperature up. In the case of steam, you're taking the uh, temperature up by basically transforming water into gas, gaseous water, which of course is, uh, looks like steam, transports a lot more energy as steam, so the system can be smaller. Um, but these typically have the same kind of boilers, the same kinds of systems. Forced hot air is basically uh, where you're heating air itself and blowing the air into the greenhouse compartment. Again, this is something that all of you, I think, are going to be interested in if you get go past the point of screenhouses. In a screenhouse, I don't think it makes sense to do any heating, but in a polyethylene film house and more, it makes perfectly good sense to start heating and then to actually improve your winter production substantially because you put the plants into warmer conditions. Infrared heat is something that you frequently hear about. This is basically a, a steel tube that's hanging over the plants. The steel tube is fired directly into, so it glows, and the radiant heat basically radiates down onto the plants. For citrus, this is not what you're going to want because your plants are tall, and this only heats the top layer of the plants. So if somebody says, oh, you can save a lot of money doing this, you're going to find that your plants aren't the same, and that's going to be a problem. So I recommend uh, uh, these kinds of heating systems only for very small plants like bedding plants. Maybe in, maybe in a propagation house you might also have something like that. So um, let's talk about cooling systems. And this, this takes us to one very unfortunate part of here, and this is, this is where if you would keep the pitchforks down, I would really appreciate it, but I've got some bad news, okay? So watch as we go through and look at all these cooling systems. They all have a little problem for you, okay? So vents, this is the easiest, cheapest thing you can do to cool your greenhouse, just open the vents. Let the air out, okay? Well, you can't let air out without letting air in, right? That ain't gonna work. So when you let air out, air has to come in, so usually we have roof vents and side vents, and as you open the roof vents, you also open the side vents so air can come in from the side and then go out through the top, along with your bugs. This is good for maybe 10 degrees of cooling, not much more than that. In fact, I don't think you can even count on 10 degrees unless you have uh, some wind. Forced air ventilation, of course, is when we make wind ourselves with fans, and basically we have exhaust fans and contrary to popular perception here is these fans are always blowing out. They're never blowing in. If you go into greenhouse where the fans are blowing in, something ain't right, okay? So these fans are designed to move air out, and then again, on the other side of the building, there has to be some way for air to come in. And 
in many places on the planet where forced air ventilation is used, all you need is these exhaust fans. But if you have low humidity conditions, which those of you who are growing in the in central California have very low humidity, you can also then put pads up and have fan and pad cooling. So with the same energy that you've invested for moving air, you can also get cooling, and, and active evaporative cooling. And so here again, this is, this is uh, one of the things that uh, you will frequently see in, in, in greenhouses in California, is that we have these wet pads, and air pulls through these wet pads, and on the outside there will be louvers that can be closed at night. These are paper, okay, and have little holes about this big, Let's face it, a June bug can go through these holes, okay? So there's no exclusion here. If you want exclusion here, you're gonna have to work and do something else because these greenhouses, they might look like they're confined spaces, but they're not that confined. No exclusion, really. Positive pressure cooling is done this way. Basically, you have either a swamp cooler or some sort of system where you do the evaporation of water, the air has to push through, and this was funny because I was visiting here, but on the exclusion there was a door on the side and it was open. Okay, that's because this particular exclusion is nonsense because when you do screen your wet pads, you're gonna to have to put a lot of baffling in there. And if you don't, then you will burn out the fans on the other side of the greenhouse because they're constantly working like, like crazy to try to get air through and simply having a little shed on the side that's made out of screen material is not enough to screen the wet pads. So screening is, is, is complicated here, and if you can't get it to work and your equipment breaks down, you're gonna be opening the door and there goes your exclusion. There's another little warning flag, folks. When you start having problems with your exclusion, you're gonna be opening the doors. You're gonna be opening the vents. So, this is a conventional type of positive pressure. You have basically what is a swamp cooler. It blows into the greenhouse. Inside the greenhouse, you have convection tubes like this that transport that cooled air in. The only problem with these kinds of systems is that typically they don't have enough cooling capacity to actually achieve the cooling you need around Bakersfield and Fresno and Visalia and in those kinds of places, not even around Davis. So. Uh, this, this is likely to be an issue and it's something I would, be, I would be cautious with if you're going to be installing a positive pressure system. Make sure you look at them, make sure they have the capacity to do what you want to do. Fog is frequently touted as a way of cooling, but you have to remember that to get fog to work, you put in a pulse of fog, wait until some cooling has achieved, this is a couple of seconds, then that air, that humid air, once it's 100% humidity, has to be removed, new air has to be brought in, which you can then give another pulse for. Again, exclusion? Maybe. So shading is something we frequently do as part of cooling, especially when we can't really handle it. Um, and so there we end up with whitewash material or shade curtains of some sort, and you can have automated shade curtain systems that are inside. You can have shade that's on the outside. Var a variety of things are possible. And about the only thing that isn't feasible is air conditioning because of the massive amount of energy involved in running a compressor. So for the most part, you will see air conditioning in only the most desperate situations, like air pollution around UC Riverside. I saw 20 years ago at Riverside, there were some greenhouses that were actually air conditioned. I don't know if you guys still have them, but uh, that is not something that's feasible in, in the production setting. So, um, let me see what my time looks like. I'm almost out of time. Uh, so anyway, with regard to the heating and cooling, basically I'm just gonna go quickly through the cooling because here's a, a video that shows how the cooling works. And so in, in this particular uh, video, which will come up momentarily. In this video, I'm going to illustrate some key, concept of, key concepts of greenhouse production. In a typical greenhouse, you will find that there are generally exhaust fans which sit on one side of the greenhouse, and these fans are pushing air out of the greenhouse. On the opposite side of the greenhouse, clear on the other end, you may find fan and pad systems, and particularly the pads which are, at this stage, wet because water has been put on them. 
this is where air comes into the greenhouse that is basically being pushed out on the other side of the greenhouse. This particular greenhouse is located at the UC Davis campus and in this particular greenhouse we actually do not have enough potential cooling during the summer to fully cool the greenhouses with just energy that we would use through electricity. So in this particular house we also do something called whitewashing which means that we spray onto the glass a product that's been made explicitly for this purpose and this allows us to reduce the amount of solar radiation inside the greenhouse. So a lot of greenhouses in hot climates such as the Central Valley of California have this kind of provision where basically we try to reduce the amount of sunlight that comes in. Also in these houses typically we have some sort of a thermostat as you can see right here in the middle of this house. Typically we hang this thermostat in amongst the plants so that we get a representative condition sample for, um, for the greenhouse from that particular location. In this particular house the fans pretty much run all the time at this point of the, time of the day because the greenhouse still can only barely keep up with the cooling load. But at a time when this greenhouse is able to cool itself, then what will happen is the uh, air that's being pulled in the greenhouse will be warmer on the end where the fans are and cooler on the opposite end of the greenhouse. So this sets up a gradient in the greenhouse and if you leave it as a gradient in the greenhouse, you will find that plants in the cooler conditions grow slower than plants in the warmer conditions. So what we have in this greenhouse also are another special kind of fan called horizontal airflow fans and these fans are sitting up high and once the cooling cycle is complete, these fans kick in and start blowing the air around so that it stirs the air just like a big pot. The end effect is that the greenhouse climate is made uniform by these horizontal airflow fans. As you can see, they are not mounted in the center, they're mounted off to the side. This one is mounted to blow towards us, and there's another one in this somewhat small house over in this, over there, which blows in the other direction, and that basically establishes the uh, uniformity in this particular greenhouse. So with respect to the type of management system, the, the, the problem that I see is that we need the air exchanges, but if we're going to seal the greenhouse tight, you're not going to get that. So let's take a look at why we need these air exchanges. We need them for one thing, for cooling, and you know, if you have venting or fan pad cooling or mist and fog, all those require that you do vent the humid air out. CO2 is another thing. This is something that was learned in Colorado in the 70s when they had their first energy crisis. And it's basically, okay, we'll, cool, we'll close all the greenhouses down. And the first thing they noticed was that the plants didn't grow at all. They just sat there. They did nothing. Well, the problem is they had drawn the CO2 down. And when the CO2 is down much below ambient, the plants are just sitting there. They're not making car biomass. It's like nothing to do. They just sit there. They're on vacation. So at that point, you have to either inject CO2 manually for some system where you're buying the CO2 or creating the CO2, or you have to vent from the outside. So we have this notion in general that these greenhouses are closed systems, but they're not. They're, they're actually wide open. There's almost nothing in these systems that's closed. It's not closed from an energy point of view. Jim already mentioned that from an irrigation point of view, you're supposed to have it closed, but honestly, no grower has yet figured out how to do it because we always have this water that becomes useless because we've got too much sodium, or too much calcium or something. So we're actually in sort of a, a chaos system right now, a situation where we're trying to get systems that, uh, that uh, get better and better so that we can get close, close to being closed. For right now, it's not really feasible. So this is one of the tricks is that it's an extremely complicated environmental control strategy and I'm only touching on the various parts of that right here. Okay? So there's much more to be discussed. And, and really, you could easily have a whole afternoon of discussion just about specific elements of these various environmental variables 
how they interplay with each other, and how when you deal with one to optimize one, you mess something else up. Now, I did want to spend just a little bit of time talking about uh, an innovative new technology that I've been working on, and that is a solar photovoltaic nursery system. And this has become very interesting to me, and, and I have a lot of text here, but obviously I don't have enough time to go through all of this. But basically, photovoltaics, I just want to introduce that to you real quick because it's a money maker. Okay? Photovoltaics is when you have basically a substrate where sunlight shines it and it creates electrons and et cetera, dot, 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 dot. I'm not going to cover all the details here, but that makes electricity. Okay? And you see solar panels all over uh, roofs, and the question has been asked, can you just put these solar panels over your plants? so that you make electricity, cast shadow, and grow the plants in this shade. Conventional solar panels, of course, make 100% shade. That's a little too much for nearly all plants, except mushrooms. Anybody want to grow mushrooms? Not, not yet, OK. So anyway, Solinder has this technology where they make this out of tubes, and their panels are these arrays of tubes, OK? So. Um, Basically, I had the idea that we would create a shade house with these tubes overhead, which would make electricity, and then I could grow plants underneath here. And so I have a project here that's actually running at UC Davis right now where we have this, where we're using two, le two densities of these tubes. And this particular one, this is basically the conventional technology that the, plant, that the company puts on top of rooftops, and I'm growing plants underneath it. One of the first plants that we put underneath this was citrus. And with the help of uh, Cedar Seeger, we got some plants and we installed them in here. The result was amazing. The plants grew as well in the heaviest level of shading with the photovoltaics over the top as they did with, uh, um, without. And now this is plant production, not actual fruit production. And so one of the things I want to show you is, is that I've been looking at doing, uh, taking this shade structure that I have, and I've put and I've put into this shade structure screen compartments. So this particular screen compartment that you see right here is on the south end of my shade structure. I've basically pulled the conventional shade cloth back, and this is sitting in the full sun. You can see it has a door. We just, in fact, we are installing this right now, so I have no data. There are no plants in here yet. And so what we're looking at here is basically a conventional screen house that's sitting out in full sun. And the idea here is to look at the climate inside there to see is that climate going to be suitable for plant production. And, and then the, the, the next level, this, uh, this section here, that it's going to pan to that in a second here, this is where we have a lighter shade, maybe half the photovoltaics, so half the shade. This, ha this is another screen compartment. And then the compartment at the north end has the heaviest level of shade technology over the top. And basically what we're finding is when we stand inside these compartments, the compartment that's out in the full sun isn't, is, is exactly as what you would you expect. It's very, very hot although it is completely excluding all bugs. And we don't have anything in there right now to move air around or move air out. And this compartment here, it's got the highest level of shade. You can, you can see it. OK, it's pretty shady there. But my suspicion is that, based on what we've learned with the citrus, is that this can still be suitable for citrus production. So the key here is that this technology is a dual-use technology. You're going to make money selling the electricity, and you're going to make money selling the citrus. And I am out of time. So I don't know how much time we have left for. Well, we've got a couple yes. of time for a couple of questions, yeah. Roger. OK, the, the, uh, the shade cloth, the, the house has three sections. The shade cloth by itself, the black shade cloth, not these compartments. That shade cloth is about 35 40%. The highest level of the cylindra panels is about 70%, 70 to 
And then the section in between is about, we take every other tube out so it's half that shade level. And so for, which would be about 30, 40% shade. Cedar. But it's a different nature of shade, cedar. Yeah, it, it has the issue that because it's got gaps between the tubes, certain plant tissues are actually going to see full sunlight for periods of time, but then sh shade moves across it, you know. Are you monitoring bar light? We are, yes. Yes. One more question. Yep. It's... It, Definitely an issue. You need some sort of protection for that because, you know, if you're dealing with trying to exclude one, you know, you got to exclude it with employees walking in. You've got to exclude it with visitors. In the, in the ornamentals industry, in greenhouses that are like that, and, and one example would be look look at what chrysanthemum growers put up with with regard to uh, white rust. Okay, it's exactly the same thing. If you, if you get a white rust infection, you're out of business. Period. End of sentence. Every all, all your plants are eradicated. The whole thing gets methyl bromided or whatever. So look at what those guys are doing. And they have entry vestibules. They have fans blowing against you as you're going in the entry vestibule. Two doors, you know. So you first come in. The door has to close before the next door is allowed to open. It's honestly, growers hate that stuff. They all it breaks. You know, I've never seen one that actually works reliably. So it is a bugaboo. And it's, it's, it's on all ends, really. You're trying to plug all the holes with this screen material, and it's, I don't have really good news here. It is, you know, we haven't yet found a good solution, in my opinion. We're still trying to find a solution. Well, thank you, Heiner. Appreciate it. Okay, Gary.